Wow. <laughs> Just going to give everybody another second. I see we're still admitting yep. some folks. Thank you for just a really nice scene here. Okay, Kate, are we good? All right. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I have the honor of introducing Pastor Elisa Lucozzi from the Guilford Community Church, who is going to lead us in song. Thanks, Julie. It's great to be here with everybody. It's great to see so many faces. This is fabulous. Hey, Lisa. It's Catherine. Hey, hey Catherine. <laughs> so I'm going to lead us in a song that I think most people know. And if you don't know it, you'll catch on really quickly. This is a piece from the Poor People's Campaign that I learned um, when I was involved with them. So here goes. It, the words are, somebody's been hurting our siblings. It's, and it's gone on. And then I'll, then you'll say far too long. I'll say, yes, it's gone on. You'll say far too long. And I'll say it's gone on far too long. And then the Okay, ready? Somebody's been hurting us siblings and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. It's gone on far too long. Oh, somebody's been hurting our siblings. And it's gone on far too long. Too long. And we won't be silent anymore. <laughs> somebody's been taking our health care. And it's gone on far too long. Yes. somebody has been hurting our siblings and it's gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. Somebody's been hurting queer children and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. Tell you it's gone on far too long. Oh, somebody's been hurting their children. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. One more time. Somebody's been hurting our people. And it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. Tell you it's gone on far too long. Oh, somebody's been hurting our people. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. One more time. And we won't be silent anymore you're all beautiful thank you so much pastor elisa welcome everyone to the forum on the right to health care and housing sponsored by the vermont workers center we're here because health care and housing affect tens of thousands in our state and our voices need to be heard my name is Julie and I live in St. Johnsbury. I'm a proud disabled woman who can't afford Medicare Part B. I'm over income guidelines for Medicaid to pay the Medicare premium. So I have charity care at the providers I do business with. I fill out intrusive forms to prove I'm poor. Is this fair after working over 40 years in the richest country in the world? No, that's why I fight for Medicaid for all so that no one has to beg for medical care and equipment for chronic health conditions so that they don't die. The uninsured and underinsured are not expendable. We at the Workers Center recognize health care and housing as human rights. We all need them in order to live our lives. Two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic, our government took the enormously important step of protecting our rights to health care and housing by prohibiting people from being kicked off of Medicaid 
and evicted from their homes. But now the federal government has allowed Vermont and other states to end these protections as soon as July, leaving tens of thousands of people in our state at risk. We are here today to draw the attention to this urgent threat and to make sure our government continues to protect Medicaid and housing for our communities. In this forum, we'll welcome public officials who represent us, bring public attention to the threat of Medicaid cutoffs and evictions, share stories about the importance of healthcare and housing in our lives, and take action together to make sure that nobody's healthcare or housing is taken away. We're pleased to be joined by a listening panel of public officials. We'd like to welcome representatives Brian Cena, Elizabeth Burroughs, Leslie Goldman, and Tanya Bohofsky, Senator Cheryl Hooker and Ann Cummings, and Chief Healthcare Advocate Mike Fisher for joining tonight to hear our experiences and concerns. Because of legislative committee meetings and the floor schedule, we understand that some of these officials may not be able to join the full forum. Thank you for attending. If you're a public official and I haven't read your name, please put it in the chat so we'll know you're here. A few logistics. This event will feature closed captioning. To view the live transcript, click the button with three dots on the bottom right-hand corner, then click full view transcript. If you need help with this or other tech issues, please send a chat to Michelle O'Donnell or Carly Abrams. Please mute, mute yourself when you're not speaking so that others are not distracted by background noise. If you are on the phone, use star six to mute or unmute. Please rename yourself to include your town and if you want, your gender pronouns. To do this on Zoom, click on the three dots in the upper right and select rename. If you need assistance to do this, uh, put your name in town and pronouns in the chat and our tech person can update your name for you. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted to YouTube. If you don't want your testimony to be published, please say so in the chat or email info at workercenter.org. Events like this can be difficult at times. Tonight, members of the Vermont Worker Center Community Care Team are here for support if you need someone to talk to, Grace and Liz, can you unmute and say hello so folks can see who you are? Hello, everybody. Welcome. Good to see you here. Hey, y'all. I'm Liz. Thank you. Their info is in the chat, or you can call or text Grace at 802-380-8501. And Liz at 802-498-8682. The program tonight will have three blocks of story sharing. Between them, there will be brief songs that you are welcome to sing along with on mute. Before our first group of stories, I'm gonna pass it over to Eliza for a bit of context. Eliza? Hey everyone, my name is Eliza Hale. I live just south of Barrie, and I'm really happy to be with you here tonight. Um, I'm lucky enough to get health coverage through my husband's work. Uh, he's a school teacher, but a few years ago when <clears throat> they came after teachers' so-called Cadillac healthcare plans, our insurance went through a blackout period, and we got the bill in the mail for our daughter's birth, $16,000. Who do you know that can pay 16 grand out of pocket or pay for premiums that don't fit our budgets? And this whole mess is solvable. Poor people and people struggling to make ends meet, people experiencing homelessness, we are not at fault. The system is rigged, poverty is violence, healthcare and housing profits are violence. And that's why I'm fighting. It's time to put people and the planet over profit. And this forum is about the right to health care and housing, because we at the Worker Center, we understand that our fundamental needs, such as housing and health care, are also our human rights. These are rights that we should all enjoy by virtue of being human. Public policy should reflect that basic truth. But unfortunately, here in Vermont and the US, 
there's this wide gulf between these shared values and our public policies. Many of us here today are on Medicaid and are concerned about losing access once the cutoffs begin. Uh, the pandemic, it pulled back the curtain on the failure of this healthcare system to include everyone. And in the face of a global health emergency, created a Band-Aid. But we know the right to healthcare, just like the right to housing, these are not limited to a pandemic. The state now has millions of federal dollars coming in, what's touted as a once in a lifetime opportunity. Vermont should use this money to sustain the measures that were put in place to fill these holes and expand them. Temporary Medicaid is only temporarily helpful and emergency housing is not the same as a permanent home. There are estimates that 30,000 people are at risk of losing Medicaid through the redetermination process, which will start when the pandemic emergency is officially declared over. And we know <clears throat> that the healthcare crisis does not only affect people on Medicaid, the crisis affects people who are uninsured, underinsured, saddled with medical debt, or those who get caught between hospitals and insurers as they square off in these fights over costs. It also affects home care and health care workers who we all depend on for care and who are dealing with chronic and dangerous levels of understaffing and low pay right now. The bottom line is that health care and housing are rights. They should not be treated as commodities or sources of profit. We're here to share our stories tonight, to shed light on the very specific ways that people are affected by the healthcare and housing crises here in Vermont. We hope that the members of our listening panel will reflect on what they hear tonight and think about the kinds of systemic solutions that can address the root causes of these problems. So we're gonna hear from six people right now who signed up to share their stories. I know that others of you uh, have also signed up. And if you did, we've got you on the list. Um, however, feel free to put your name in the chat just to confirm that we have you. Um, if you're on the phone, uh, you can text or call Anders at this number, 802-505-0286. And if you haven't yet signed up but want to speak and share your story, likewise, go ahead, put your name in the chat right now or text or call Anders, again, 802-505-0286. And we'll get to as many speakers as we possibly can. We're asking each person to keep your comments to two minutes or less. When your name's called, please unmute yourself and remute when you're done. Um, so that we can hear from as many as possible. I'll let Manny explain how we're doing timekeeping. Hi, thanks, Eliza. My name's Manny and I'll be the timekeeper tonight. Um, so what, what will happen is um, a minute and 45 seconds into your uh, story, you will hear something like this. Can you hear that? And that'll let you know that you have 15 seconds or so to wrap up your story. And if for some reason you really have a head of steam and you're having trouble winding down, you might hear something like this, which is not to be obnoxious or, or um, cut anybody short, but my job is to make sure as many people as possible get to share their stories. So if you, if you start hearing that second bell, it's time to really finish up your sentence and feel free to continue sharing on chat if you have more that you haven't been able to share verbally. So please don't take it personally when your time is up. We're just trying to make room for as many stories as possible. Thank you. Great, thanks, Manny. Um, so first up, we have Maggie with Nat on deck. Maggie? Hey, can everybody hear me? All right. My name is Maggie Belenz and I work as an emergency room nurse at UVM Medical Center. I've worked as a nurse for seven years and each day I show up, I find myself surrounded by individuals who have nowhere else to turn and fill up the emergency department seeking refuge from our current healthcare system. 
it's failing them. There are people who end up in the department because they're in need of a safe place to sleep, because they can't find a primary care doctor, because they are uninsured, because it'll take eight months to see a specialist, or they're at a point where their chronic health conditions can no longer be ignored. We have an extremely advanced capability when it comes to taking care of the acutely sick, strokes, heart attacks, trauma patients, but the system struggles greatly to provide our care um, to the community. Mental health care, primary preventative care, permanent affordable housing solutions, all while Americans pay the highest prices for health care in the world. Our system is set up so that the money flows to the insurance companies instead of paying competitive wages to healthcare workers. The money flows to the healthcare network executives instead of to training teachers to ensure there'll be new talent entering the healthcare workforce. The money flows to pharmaceutical companies from the wallets of working class Vermonters and the rich get richer and the poor and dispossessed are left behind. We are calling on you, our elected officials, to work with the public on creating a sustainable, inclusive, fair and affordable healthcare system. This is hard work, yes, but Vermonters are suffering right now and these problems are only projected to get worse on the course we are on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maggie. Nat? Awesome, thanks, Eliza. Um, so my name's Nat and I live on the far side of the river over in New Hampshire on the, um, yeah, on the east side of the Connecticut River Valley. And I'm one of many people in the US that'll lose their healthcare insurance once the state of emergency ends. When I finished college, I figured I had until age 26, I could explore whatever I'd imagined to be life-giving or new, adventurous, even dangerous. Um, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, my mother's healthcare insurance through her work at the hospital would ensure I had access to healthcare regardless of my job. However, my brilliant carpe diem plan was foiled when the coronavirus pandemic Play, uh, place the world on hold and clogged up the already devastatingly slow system of bureaucracy. In the spring of 2020, I lost both my part-time jobs. When I contacted the state of Vermont in hopes of filing for unemployment insurance, I was told I made too little money to qualify, so I was pissed. For the next four months, I would live off my savings that I'd worked to accumulate over the years. That June, I turned 26 and lost my coverage under my parents' plan. I still had no, no source of income, and as a healthy 26-year-old, I didn't feel like it was the worst predicament until my year-long prescription I needed then need to be, needed to be removed, renewed. I was still relying on a nurse practitioner from my home state of Indiana. After getting in touch with her office, she agreed to write me another prescription, but that I needed to, to establish care here in the Upper Valley region. Fair enough, but we were only knee deep in the pandemic at that point and I had to hop on to finding a new PCP. And the first step in that process was figuring out my insurance. After spending hours on the phone and still being told I made too little to qualify for unemployment insurance, I wasn't excited about the prospect of jumping on um, another set of bureaucratic hoops. However, I still was unemployed and underqualified for unemployment. So Medicaid was the best option I had. After filing, filling out the paperwork and having two extended phone conversations, I finally had free health coverage. Um, after doing some research online, I found that the nearest hospital was Mount Escutney and they were taking patients with Medicaid. So I filled out new patient paperwork, gave it back and didn't hear back. So I gave them a call and they needed insurance from my previous healthcare provider. After getting on the phone back and forth um, with my previous healthcare provider and my intended new one, I still didn't receive, um, didn't get in with a primary care provider there. I, um, over the course of three months, still couldn't get in to see a primary care provider. And so I switched my lens and focused to find healthcare elsewhere. I ended up relying on a free clinic um, that was for LGBTQ folks um, through the Good Neighbor Health Center. 
Um, and through their generous donations, I've been able to get health coverage there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nat. Next, we have Abel and then um, Lisa on deck to share Amy's story. Abel? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Abel Luna. I'm an organizer with Migrant Justice. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. Um, yeah, and and uh, the issues uh, of housing and healthcare are very important to our community, uh, the American community, uh, so farm workers that are milking cows in Vermont. Um, and our experience with housing um, is that uh, there are many issues um, and to give sort of an examples, um, you know, people are living in over overcrowded housing conditions. Um, you have three to four people sharing the same room. Uh, they just take turns, um, depends on the shift that they work. Um, you know, sometimes the heating system on farms doesn't work, um, you know, talking about Vermont in the winter. Um, there's issues with running water, with uh, drinking water, um, and also a lot of issues with bed bugs. Um, you know, people sleeping with bed bugs uh, for a long time. Um, not every farm is like that in Vermont. Um, you know, there are good farms, uh, but there are farms where this is the reality um, in their experience. Um, you know, and so if we don't have a house where we feel safe, um, where we feel um, that we have the dignity to sleep and rest um, and uh, get adequate rest, um, you know, um, we're, you know, we're going to get sick, farm workers get sick, and their experience is that, um, you know, farm workers on the farm don't go to the doctor, people take pills and hope that, you know, whatever pain goes away, um, you know, because a visit to the doctor, uh, it translates into thousands or hundreds of dollars um, that come out of your pocket. Um, and, you know, we, people cannot afford it. Um, we have families that depend, um, you know, on, on, on the wages that people are earning. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, we're here because, um, you know, people shouldn't have to choose um, between their health uh, or, or housing and, and um, putting food on the tables. Um, you know, we all have um, a lot of things in common, um, especially this need for you know, fundamental human rights, um, such as affordable health care and safe, accessible, equitable housing. Um, so it's time for Vermont to put the people um, you know, before profit. It's time to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abel. Uh, Lisa with Amy's story. Hey folks, uh, my name is Lisa King. Sorry, just a little technical difficulties. Probably a lot of devices there. There's um, an in-person gathering where they're watching together. So they're just figuring out the sound. Try again. Okay, hi, how are you doing? Oops. Still not quite. All right, there we go. Okay, hi, once again, I'm Lisa King and I'm speaking for Amy who couldn't be here tonight. Okay, she says, hi, my name is Amy, Amy and I'm in Barrie, Vermont. I've been homeless for a year and a half and getting out of an abusive relationship with a struggle. Once I got a room after staying underneath a bridge for a month and a half in the cold, I still wondered if I will have a roof over my head. At the end of my voucher, which is up every month, are they going to tell me I have to leave and I have nowhere to go? I do the paperwork and have everything I need, but I don't know how I can afford housing as it's so high. It's impossible to imagine running a place. Even a room in someone's house is more than my social security will cover, along with all my other costs. This can't be the way for someone in a country with so much to, to live. I fight to stay alive every day. I want to give up, but the Lord says to keep at it. I am glad to know there are others out there fighting and together we will change what doesn't make sense, like living under a bridge or in a motel room. I hope the motel vouchers continue, but this isn't the answer. Housing is a human right and living under a bridge is a healthcare issue. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Next up, we have Skyler, followed by SJ. Skyler. Hey, everyone. 
I'm Skylar. I'm 26. I was born and raised in Burlington. This is my third winter back after many years away and possibly my last because I'm totally priced out. I'm trained as a peer specialist uh, for mental health crises, uh, substance use, et cetera. Uh, in New York City, I was making $20 an hour to do this critical work. The same exact job, which is desperately needed here in Vermont, uh, pays just $14 an hour. $14 is not enough to meet my basic needs, anyone's basic needs, uh, especially um, because my own mental health care, access to that is necessary to be able to help other people so in the process of switching careers, um, because I can't afford that life, <laughs> I've been unemployed. Um, and for the first time ever, I qualify for Medicaid. So after years of making too much for Medicaid, but being too poor to access the care that I needed, uh, I was often forced to go without. So in 2019, I was early in my medical transition as a trans person, and I experienced a lot of violence from others as a result. Um, I was sexually assaulted by my Uber driver, and when I reported that to Uber, they silenced me and banned me from the app for life. Um, I became suicidal and desperately needed inpatient care to save my life, but I couldn't go because I had a $5,000 deductible with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. So when we talk about mental health and say things like, just ask for help, the reality is um, I couldn't access help until now. And on Medicaid, I live under a constant threat that a slight change in my income means that I lose this ability to meet my needs. So I live off of and pay rent with dwindling unemployment savings. My rent is $900 a month, not including utilities uh, for a one bedroom in Barrie. But the bedroom I found out in December is not insulated. So it's pretty cold um, and my electric cost for the winter is $2,000 and counting. I receive heating assistance that covers a lot of this, but if I were to get a job, any job, even at 14 an hour, I would no longer qualify for heating assistance and I would lose my access to healthcare, food stamps all at once. So all this is to say, uh, Vermont consistently chooses to abandon the poor and working class while pretending that they don't. Healthcare and housing are a human right. Thank you. Thank you, Skylar. SJ, and then we'll hear from Des next after SJ. Beautiful. Can everyone hear me all right? Awesome. Alrighty. My name is SJ, and I am currently in my senior year of high school in Keene, New Hampshire, and I'm here to talk about my healthcare story. Um, so I remember the first time feeling truly segregated due to my position with healthcare. Um, my beautiful, amazing mother, she raised three girls practically on her own. And when my parents split up, I moved in with my mom and she had just quit her job. We ended up without healthcare for a couple of months and the feeling of knowing that you can't afford to get hurt or go to the hospital stuck in my mind and the conversations of how expensive healthcare was out of pocket and the strain to put on my mom. It was hard to watch or even process as, as a sophomore in high school. The real eye opener though was at my first job. I worked with a couple of peers from my school and one day they started to talk about healthcare. They talked about how they felt bad for other people without healthcare and couldn't imagine not having it. There was a deep sense of shame and guilt that I've never felt before and it created a gap between us. This is just one example of the system pinning one person against the other, even though we're all on the same team. Growing up in this time period is scary, especially as a youth, because the American dream isn't realistic anymore. I see it as in a, I see it as we are in a deep hole and we're given a ladder that only reaches halfway up. There's no way to climb out, but we are always told we can dig our way out if we work hard enough, try better, and put in more effort. It's designed for failure to keep us at the bottom. And honestly, I am scared. I'm scared for my future. I'm scared for the future of generations to come. And I'm scared for our planet. And this all comes back to the simple fact that we aren't giving our basic needs in order to survive, let alone live our lives to our full potential. And that's why I'm fighting for healthcare, to be treated as a human and have basic human rights to my health and to create a world where our purpose is to live, not just survive. Thank you, SJ. Next, um, Des. 
I'm Des Sheher from Burlington. <clears throat> You'll have to excuse me a little bit. I've been teary today because I had a hard day at work. Um, so when I was 19, I was diagnosed with severe ulcerative colitis. I had to do um, chemotherapy. I had a bunch of medications. I spent most of my 20s um, dealing with all of that. <sighs> Sorry. I ended up having a total colectomy. <sighs> Sorry. Which is, I had my entire large intestine removed and I had my insides kind of rebuilt. And so I've been disabled since I was about 23. And this has had lasting repercussions for my whole life. <sighs> The reason I'm in this position today is because of everything that happened. I had insurance deny my surgery. Um, they said it wasn't necessary. It was an emergency surgery. I perforated my bowel. I was literally going to die. And then they made me prove that I needed my chemotherapy. And so after my surgery, I spent months driving around town with my grandmother just driving me around in her van to like pick up all this paperwork from my doctors and everything instead of um instead of healing I couldn't even walk yet because I had my whole abdomen cut open and uh so that's what I spent my time doing instead of healing was trying to prove to Aetna and United Healthcare that dying was actually important I guess and uh, so after all of this, I had to fight with them. They kept losing my paperwork every time I sent it in. I had to recollect it about three times. And then eventually um, someone at UVM told me to call the state's attorney general office. And I, that's the only time they found my paperwork um, was under the threat of the state's attorney general's office. And so they found my paperwork and they processed it and they told me that my anesthesia was unnecessary. And so I still owed $4,000, sorry. And so I luckily qualified for the UVM patient care assistant program because I wasn't able to work for about five, five years or so. And, uh, it's just had so many lasting repercussions in my life. I had to take out credit cards and I ruined my credit because I couldn't pay rent or buy groceries or pay for heating, or any, of that, any of that stuff. While I was going through treatment and I would work for a little bit to gain money and then I would earn too much money and I would lose any kind of benefits that I had. I can't marry my boyfriend because I will become a dependent and lose all any access to anything. Um, and he can't afford to pay for me. I'm, I'm a full person. I'm a full adult. Um, I'm not dependent. And so my life is kind of on hold all the time because I can't get a good job. Um, I have to make sure everything I do follows the benefit cliff um, or that I can have access to my medications or to my doctor's appointments. I still have to go to physical therapy because my walking got all screwed up during that period of time where I was supposed to be doing physical therapy instead of running around town, fighting paperwork and all that good stuff. Um, and so it's just, it's just really upsetting because my life is still completely ruined because of everything that happened when I was 19, but something that I never asked for. I got pneumonia because I was working at a factory because my family is poor. <laughs> And now here I am. And so that's why, that's why I joined the Workers' Center. Um, I met Sarah at an event and um, told her my story. And she said, you know, come with me. And um, I've been here ever since. And we're with you, Des. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm going to pass it now to Ashley, who's going to give us a call to action of what we can do. Thanks, Eliza, and, and thanks to everyone who shared their stories. 
it's really moving, really powerful, and I'm really happy to be fighting with all of you. Uh, my name is Ashley Andrews, and I am also one of the people who's anxiously waiting to be kicked off of Vermont Medicaid. My struggle as a mother trying to get basic care for myself and my children is what brings me to this movement. Um, and I want to briefly interrupt with a moral call to action. Everyone should have just received an email with important information about a call in day to our legislators taking place tomorrow and about the 10 petition challenge, which is a pledge to recruit 10 family members, friends, and neighbors to sign the Forward Together petition on housing and healthcare by April 1st. We have maybe 100 people in this room today, but we need to multiply to 500, 1,000, 10,000. Please check your email and join us for tomorrow's call-in day and the 10 petition challenge. Right now, in the chat, write down 10 petition challenge and or call-in day if you will take these actions with us. Next, we're gonna have Liz and Tev share another song with us. All right. Can you hear me? This is Tev. Um, I'm a member from Central Vermont, and uh, gonna yeah, I'm gonna start us off. Um, this is a song probably a lot of you know. It's written um, by Florence Reese um, as part of the um, the the mine miner struggle a um, hundred years ago in the South. Um, but we we've got some new lyrics um, for for today's struggle. So. Papa, you look young. <laughs> and Rose is going to maybe help me sing, right? Do you want to help me sing which side are you on? Yeah. Okay. So here it goes. Come working and poor people, good news to you I'll tell of how a nonviolent Medicaid army is coming here to dwell. Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, people? Which side are you on? 140 million can't meet our basic needs. It's not because we're lazy. It's because of corporate greed. We're tired of broken promises. The rates are too damn high. Don't tell us we can't afford human rights. We see right through those lies. Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? In all of 14 counties, there are no neutrals here. You're either with the people or the healthcare profiteers. Which Profit side? off our sickness, gamble with our lives. Us poor folks haven't got a chance unless we organize. Which side are you on, people? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you both. I'm also super thrilled to see the amount of you who are signing up in the chat to do the 10 petition challenge and to participate in the call in day tomorrow. Um, this is awesome. Um, so next, we are ready to hear from more folks who would like to share their stories. And we're going to start with the people who signed up when they registered for this event. But it's not too late to sign up or speak. Just put your name in the chat or text or call Anders. That number is 802-505-0286. 
and we will do our best to get you in the queue. So first up is Catherine Brunig with Sarah Brunkhorst on deck. Catherine, are you here with us? Yes, I, I was oh, going awesome. to press the button to mute. That's what I was going to do. Perfect, we can hear you now. Cool, loud and clear, okay. Hi, my name is Catherine. Bunig, and I live in Westboro, Vermont. I am 38 years old, and I have a disability. And I grew up having Down syndrome. My dad got me onto Medicaid, and I don't want to lose it. It's a big part of my life because it includes paying my therapist and other things in my life. And if I lose it, my life, I won't be where I am right now. It will hurt me a lot. I know it will. And so I know I'll be want my ears anyway. This is why I'm fighting for our human rights. Um and and right there is true. That's what I that's what I, I said. And there's a lot of things in my life. Um, my dad did. Even now, I'm now I finally got a job right now. Thank goodness. And 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 I don't want to lose it, but. Uh, because I'm I'm already on on the Medicaid those kind of things, and and so many things I'm doing cause Medicaid and my dad said so I do um get it short and so. And I definitely want to um, call in tomorrow and it, like later, and I just want to know um, who my next leader is, if I want to do that. Thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing. And we, we definitely have folks that can, can help figure out who our legislators are and, and how to reach them. So thank you for sharing with us. You're welcome. Really powerful. Um, next up, we have Sarah Brunkhorst. Sarah. Hi, everyone. My name is Ren Lansky, and I'm going to be reading for Sarah Brunkhorst. Can, can everyone hear me? Great. My name is Sarah Brunkhorst. I'm 24, 24 years old, and I became eligible for Medicaid in 2019 during my year of service with AmeriCorps as I made less than a minimum wage through the program. The pandemic struck mid-service and I have fortunately been able to stay on Medicaid since. It has been such an amazing thing to have this coverage. Vermont is not an easy place for young adults to find a, jo a job with benefits. And I have been forced to piece together multiple part-time jobs which offer no benefits like health insurance. Without this extended coverage, I would still be on my mother's high deductible health insurance plan for another year and would have been put in deep financial trouble when I needed emergency life-saving life -saving surgery last September. 
<clears throat> for the first time in my life, I have been able to access medical care when I need it without a second thought. Thanks to Medicaid, I've been able to access family planning services, retreat, receive treatment for chronic pain, find answers for other chronic conditions, get dental care, and more. There is a large, staggering, terrifying gap between those who qualify for services like Medicaid and those who can afford to live without them. I live in that gap. And that's why I believe that Medicaid coverage should be extended to everyone, regardless of income. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So next up is Emily Countant. And we have Anne Wade on deck after Emily. So Emily. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, hello. Um, my name is Emily Coutant. And um, so uh, I have a story that I have a lot of stories, but um, I just want to tell you one that's kind of going to be relatable. Um, so with my medication, um, uh, so sometimes like without me even knowing it, my, my medic, my Medicare and my Medicaid just sometimes they just decide that it's not a, um, a medical necessity anymore. And so this is where my family uh, and I have to fight and fight and fight and write and call. And um, I have a really, really bad seizure disorder, one of my problems. And so when I get too stressed out, like without my right medication, <laughs> um, I get a lot of seizures that are very, um, that affect me really terribly. And so I just, um, uh, so right, so it really, um, so what else do I want to say? Just, um, I am six, I was 16 when I got my first seizure. I am about to be 41. Um, and I am too sick to work. Um, I cannot drive. So I have to be driven everywhere. I am in constant, ridiculous physical pain all the time from different stuff. And um, I've been very touched by some of, by the stories about, um, about just people having to just fight and fight and fight and fight for, you know, our, for our right to be as healthy as possible. And I, I mean, I'm lucky enough to um, to uh, just be educated and have support. And, but what really um, I'm very passionate about also is the people who don't um, have education or anything like that. And they don't know their opportunities. That is what I'm very passionate about, but just, you know, but um so right so uh goodbye thank you thank you so much for sharing now we're gonna go to ann wade with jess sanville on deck uh, do you want to mute can you hear me hello yeah. hi i'm a nervous ann wade a retired nurse from Washington, Vermont. And in 2011, when the Act 48 passed in the Vermont legislature, I was, my life was a disaster. I was working at a nursing home, third shift in hostile conditions and 
My mother's health was deteriorating rapidly. My siblings wanted me to put our mother into a nursing home. And after working in one, I just, there was no way I could do that. And I couldn't afford the COBRA health insurance. And I just felt like everything was falling in on me. But fortunately, I found out about um, Medicaid and I was eligible and I was awarded Medicaid and it changed my whole world. You know, I was able to keep my mother at home and she passed away peacefully. Um, you know, it was just, it was a, it was a beautiful death. It sounds kind of weird, but, um, and it wasn't easy, but I was so grateful and proud that I was able to provide her the care she deserved and wanted. And since then, I've been more productive and happier than ever. I, I do a lot of volunteering and I help seniors stay at home and I'm celebrating six years of sobriety and an active member of AA. And there's been many times when I felt like people looked down on me for being on Medicaid with statements like, when are you gonna get a real job? And um, caregiving is a real job. And we desperately need more because there's so many people out there that are in need of help. And, and I'm not delusional. I know that it won't be easy to change the system and the insurance companies and pharmacies and big businesses have created this awful machine that pumps out pain and misery and instead of helping people that need help and but we need to start somewhere and i just am proposing that we start funding act 48 and shift our focus to people and not profit thank you Thank you so much, Anne. So next we have Jess Sandville with Sarah Kruger on deck. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm from East, I'm from East Haven, and my pronouns are she, her, and I would like to let you know why I am telling my story tonight. Listening to all the stories tonight has been very touching and you guys are not alone we all are fighting for health care and housing sometimes as well because it's part of life can't stop fighting for what you believe in hi my name is jessica and i am a person with a disability I'm 42 years old. I live in East Haven with my home care provider and her three children and my a roommate. I have lived with Erica for almost 12 years. I am a member of the Vermont Worker Center. I'm, I'm also on the base billing team for our OC chapter. I also volunteer at the United Community Church where my home care provider works. Um, in my, what, if I didn't have Medicaid or Medicare, I would not be able to live with a home care provider or be a part of an agency that has a Medicaid waiver. Um, or be able to have the love and care of a sure support team. I would not be able to pay for my meds or my doctor's visits. I have, I have, I have also had Addison's disease for most of my life. I also have an endocrinologist for my Addison's disease. And thank you, Jessica Sandville. And that, that's why I'm fighting for health care. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jessica. Next, we have Sarah Kruger with Mary Garrison on deck. Hey there, everybody. My name is Zoe, and I'm going to be reading Sarah's story. My name is Sarah Kruger. I'm 33 years old. I live in Plainfield, Vermont, and I'm a tree service technician. I moved to Vermont in 2020, and at the time, my income exceeded the eligibility cutoff for Medicaid. But my other options for health care were atrocious. I could get an affordable plan but with a ridiculously high deductible of $7,000 with no doctor's visits and just catastrophic care, or I could, I could see a doctor and a therapist and have regular checkups and referrals, but that would be $300 a month, a cost I could not afford. So I was in this weird gray area. And then I lost my job because of COVID. And so then I qualified for Medicaid and miraculously, when I was rehired, the eligibility cutoff for Medicaid had been lifted. So I got to stay on Medicaid and my healthcare has been better than ever before. It feels like it's finally actually meeting my basic health needs. Instead of thinking to myself, something's wrong. So I'll just wait until my next annual wellness visit. I've been able to see a therapist, which has proven to be essential. I've been able to live life more fully with the reassurance that I'll be okay if something happens or goes wrong with my health. I really don't want to lose this. It's been incredible for me. There needs to be an option for everyone to have their basic needs met when it comes to health. That's why I believe that healthcare is a human right. Awesome, next we have Mary Garish with Veranda Porsche on deck. Hi, I'm Mary Garish. I'm from Bennington, Vermont. And I, I'm really moved by all these stories because I have long believed that healthcare and housing are human rights. And I know they are, and they are actual rights. And we need to name them and claim them and make sure that our legislators know that it is a governmental obligation to provide for our rights by virtue of public goods. And my own story is that I, so I have MS and when I first moved to Vermont, um, I'm on, I'm on social security and make too much for Medicaid. Um, so that was out the window and I am lucky enough to be able to take injections uh, once a week that keep my mind from getting more forgetful than it already is. Um, and luckily my neurologist, volunteered to donate that medicine to me. So that was really a blessing. And, and I do get infections more than some people. And I had a tooth infection that my whole jaw was all swollen and I can't afford a dentist. And of course, Medicare doesn't cover any of that. And I called my pr general practitioner and they said, well, we can't really do much about that. Um, is there any other problem? I said, yeah, my ear's starting to hurt now. They said, okay, well, come on in. Um, the copay is going to be 50 some dollars. And I said, okay, it's the end of the month. I don't have $50 to give you right now. Um, and they said, oh, well, then go to the emergency room. I did go to the emergency room and thank God that I did because I had a terrible infection, which actually caused me to lose a tooth and it had spread into my ear and per perforated my eardrum. Luckily at the hospital, they gave me um, antibiotics, which helped with that. But that's not, so I'm alive, but guess what? A lot of people aren't alive. and. Relative to healthcare being a human right and housing being a human right, you cannot be healthy if you're not housed. And you cannot continue to be housed if you're not healthy. These rights are interdependent and they are both really, they're human rights for the rest of the world. And the ultimate irony, by the way, which you may all know already, is that those human rights started with Eleanor Roosevelt, 
passing them on to the UN and they became internationally accepted. But guess what government doesn't accept them? That would be ours that first proposed them. So it's really important that we make sure that our legislators fulfill our rights. People are dying every day for lack of health care, for lack of housing. Here in Bennington, we still have more than 200 people in motels. And many of them are families with children. So, and there are still people on the street who are unhoused. So what does that tell us? These are people who are invisible because as far as we're concerned, people who are differently abled or who are ill or who aren't housed are invisible. It's easier that way. Well, what you're doing here today helps to make sure that they will not continue to be invisible and that we each have to make it visible by calling these out as human rights and claiming them and making sure that our legislators treat them as such. Thank you. Great, thank you. So now we have Miranda Porsche with Elizabeth Clark on deck. Hi, I'm Veranda Porsche. I'm from Guilford, Vermont. I'm a poet and a writing partner. I've been involved with this issue for a long time with the Vermont Citizens Campaign for Health, Health, a nonprofit. I uh, interviewed and gathered stories from a lot of uh, neighbors who were uninsured and we were part of uh, testifying at the Vermont State Legislature for single payer health. But the story I wanted to say today is about my daughter, Emily, who uh, you heard from earlier. In 2015, her father, my husband died. And the one thing that I neglected to do was to notify the Social Security Administration about his death. And so Emily, received a lump sum of money, which made her suddenly ineligible, ineligible for all of her benefits. And this was not done kindly. She was treated like a kind of criminal for having too much money. And she was advised to spend it down. Somebody suggested that she buy a car, that that's a classic thing that people do to spend down. And you heard her say that she can't drive. And so it was really kind of salt in the wound, spending it down to be grieving and to be told that she was somehow holding back, cheating the system. So spending down, sadly, is not difficult. I wonder if any of you could guess how much just the seizure medications cost for one month. It was $5,000. So her inheritance from her father did not last long. Oh, you're muted again, Miranda. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, just start with the last sentence. We just missed the, the last sentence. Oh, I'm sorry. Adding insult to injury is no way to treat our people. Thank you. And so, yeah, now we have Elizabeth Clark with Leanna Gayette on deck. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Now, can everybody hear me? Yeah. My name is Beth. I'm a member of the Vermont Worker Center from Barry, Vermont. I am a disabled at 47 due to a um, arthritis and tendonitis off in my body and also have heart issues. And where I live, housing went up and Medicaid does not cover a lot. 
and didn't want to see everyone denied for Medicaid. We should have Medicaid for all. Thank you so much. Catherine, you wanted to say something before you have to head out, please do. Okay. Hey, it's me again, Catherine. Good night, Um, I that's, that's something about about um this. I know people are saying this. Um bef before I got onto um it was a long time ago. I had a mom and she passed away in March 10, 2003. And 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 um and so um after she passed away and I had really hard times back then. And I think that oh when and then my dad helped me get onto Maggie and have care thing and so 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 and so and also I get prescriptions also and that does and things help me to um help me of what I have also um and so it's really important for me to um stay stay on that and that includes um have um med medicare all those kind of things forget about my my prescriptions and i don't want to um get my pills and doctor's appointments and those kind of things and so it's really i really you know what i mean and so 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 that's what I am feeling and what I said is to ruin. And that's basically about my life and what I tell you. Um, I really need it. And so um, so that's the story behind about how about I got into Medicaid, Medicare, and survive. And I want if I, I, I said, I will, I will, I'm, I'm scared, whatever the, what they're going to do, whatever, I'm scared about what's going to be happening. And, and I don't want this to end. Well, we're, we're here fighting with you, Catherine. So thank you for being so brave and sharing. And um, yeah, we, we look forward to seeing you and, and fighting with you more in the future. Okay. Thank you. You're and welcome. Next... It's nice to meet you, Catherine. You and you're not alone, sweetie. No, I know. We that. all are fighting with you. Awesome. Next up, we have Leanna Guyette. And then Clara Charlton is on deck. Oh, and actually, I think Leanna might be the last speaker we can fit into this round, but then we'll we'll have another round. So Leanna, go ahead. Okay, everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Liana Gaillet. I live in Montpelier, Vermont. I'm here to tell you about my healthcare story about the lack of transportation. I think transportation is a human right and that we need better bus services to and from appointments so that we have better healthcare for all. 
I think we need more transportation, especially from the hospital, because a lot of us rely on transportation to, to get to and from appointments. They are used to be a bus route that went up to Hospital Hill, but now it's, instead we have an app called MyRide. So I have to schedule trips in advance. So, and you need to have a phone to be able to use it. The bus route also took me to stores by the hospital that I need to go to. Walmart and big stores aren't in Montpelier. They are by the hospital. I want to see it go back there being a bus route every hour. There is no good transportation from the hospital when I've gone up there for urgent needs. I can call an ambulance if I need to go there, but I don't have a way home. The police used to do courtesy rides, but they don't do that anymore. One time I had to come home from the ER, I called a friend who was luckily awake at 1 a.m. Other time I called somebody who I knew from home health and literally, he literally came home, came from his house and gave me a ride home. I'm thankful there's nice people out there and it can be hard to find someone who, who's available. Some people need to rely on ambulances to come home. One time I overheard a conversation where somebody needed a ride home and they wouldn't do it because the person was on Medicaid. Now I refuse to go up to the hospital at night because I know it will be hard to find a way home. I think transportation is a human right and we need better bus services to and from appointments so that we have better health care for all. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm, I'm gonna pass it back to Julie, um, who's gonna take us through the next part of the, the evening. Wow, thank you everyone who's spoken. You're so brave. Such a beautiful thing to hear your stories. Um, we're gonna launch into our third and last block of story sharing. Um, for tonight. Just a reminder, if you want to speak, you can put your name in the chat and we'll get as many speakers in as we can. Before we go to our next round of speakers, let's go to Barry, where people have gathered in person to lead us in a chant. Healthcare is a human right. Housing is a human right. Healthcare is a human right. Housing is a human right. Healthcare is a human right. Housing is a human right. Healthcare is a human right. Thank you, Central Vermont crew. Um, we're going to start with Clara Charlton, Eileen, and then somebody's on deck and it just disappeared in the chat. Uh, Eli Coughlin Galbraith. So Clara, whenever you're ready. Clara, whenever you're ready. Hi, sorry. Um, my name is Clara and I'm an underemployed librarian. I recently gained full-time employment in retail in the town in which I live and have health insurance for the first time since 2017. During my 24 years in Vermont, I was mostly a single mom who at one time paid more than one third of the low way factory paycheck to the only health insurance I was able to get. My daughter was covered under Medicaid, but not me even though I made barely over $8 an hour. Um, gambling on, you know, getting a master's degree, I found uh, at one time after I graduated both a full-time academic and part-time public library job in the town I live in. After I graduated, the academic institution left Vermont in 2017, dismantled the office, and the first and only job to pay me enough money to actually live a reasonable life, plus benefits, vanished, poof. 
The cost of Vermont health insurance premiums and deductibles has been untenable for me. So I've consistently um, chosen to have a roof over my head to pay my student loans, which will never end, and to keep food on the table instead of having health insurance. This year, I will finally be able to return to the doctor to get what is hopefully still a benign lump checked after seven years. The cost of any apartment, decent or otherwise, has become almost impossible in the town and county in which I live. I was recently lucky to find a really good place for the moment, having lived in many moldy and otherwise weird or unhealthy apartments. But when that ends, I may end up having to leave the community I've called home for decades just to find affordable housing. Further, if it is affordable, will it be decent? Will it be safe? Will I have to uproot everything just to have a roof over my head and food and health insurance? Governor Scott has given many thousands of dollars to people who are able to work remotely generally already well-paying jobs, to move to Vermont. But it is regular folks who often work multiple jobs just to survive, who need structures in place to ensure what should be basic human rights. That is why I'm speaking up and fighting to have good affordable housing and affordable medical coverage for everyone because it is not health care. There is nothing caring about it. Is it, a, it is a system that makes money for people who are not us. Thank you, Clara. Just shameful. Um, Eileen, we have you up next with Eli Coughlin uh, Galbraith on deck. Hi, um, I'll be sharing for Eileen tonight. Um, she wanted to be here, but couldn't. Uh, my name is Eileen and I live in a ski town in Vermont. I'm a single working mom and I work for a youth mentoring program where I make $18,000 a year. I'm actively seeking higher paid employment, but despite multiple interviews and racing around for months, it's been a slog to say the least. As of June 1st, my daughter and I will have to move out of our current rental with nowhere to go. After a recent divorce, I had to sell my house and now can't afford to buy another one and I'm struggling to find any affordable places to rent. No one is willing to loan me money the realtor that made a profit off selling our house is unwilling to work with me in finding a new one. It's so hard looking for a place knowing that there isn't much out there. I live in a resort town and whenever I tried to bring up these sorts of issues around mm. inequity, I get blank stares. I see so much greed here and I feel abandoned by my community. And all of this upheaval and uncertainty, precarity, it's creating a lot of stress on my daughter. She's 14 and has anxiety. She doesn't know where she's gonna live next year or go to school. When you are low income, there is so much stress. There are a lot of mental health considerations. Housing is intimately connected to healthcare. They're one in the same. At my current job, they say they can take me on in a more full-time salary position but I would take a cut in my hourly and have to pay for healthcare on top. It would end up being the exact same amount of money. It just doesn't add up. And it forces people to stay below a certain income level so that they qualify for Medicaid. It's a double-edged sword and it's criminal. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'm fighting for housing and healthcare as a human right. Thank you. Thanks Eliza for sharing Eli's story and please thank them for us. Um, next, we have Alex Lawson with Bill Coleman on deck. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Eli sorry. was next. And the story that was just shared was Eileen. So their names are very similar, but not the same person. I am so sorry. Okay. I'm really, the worst a facilitator little, yeah. tonight. No, Eli, it's please. Totally. Take yeah, totally understandable. Their names are, I didn't realize that they're, how similar their names were. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Great. My name's Eli. I live and work in Brattleboro. I own my own business. We're taking hits from COVID, but we're still here. I'm transgender and I'm eight and a half months pregnant. I called Vermont Health Connect in January to tell them I was pregnant, attempt to apply for Dr. Dinosaur after 
uh, our income went down a lot. I thought I might be eligible, but because I tried for benefits, I was denied Dr. Dinosaur. I was denied my tax credit because I had applied for Dr. Dinosaur, and I was denied all prenatal health care under private coverage because someone somewhere looked at my name and my presumed gender and decided that I couldn't possibly be pregnant. I spent half my third trimester on calls, emails, voicemails, letters, invoices, appeals to legal aid. And before I was able to get my family back to the place where we started, which is paying for a high deductible tax credit assisted plan via Vermont Health Connect. It was six weeks just to be told that we were back to square one paperwork pending. It was applying. For, for Dr. Dinosaur was the worst and most stressful mistake of my entire pregnancy. I wish I'd never tried. The attempt cost me the healthcare that I had. I'm in late pregnancy now and I am uninsured. If I go into premature labor, we could still lose our business, our income, everything we've built to support the family that we're trying to grow here. Just two days ago, actually, we got our premium bill from Blue Cross, and it has an extra $800 on it marked additional adjusted invoices with no details. We're not covered until it's paid, and we don't have $800 to spare, and this kid is now three weeks out from being due. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what we're going to do, but I know that the state could help people out of this kind of crisis. We could prevent these crises from happening in the first place. If we had Medicaid for all this, this horrible fishnet of red tape that's dragging all of us down could go away. It could stop. And I, I don't want my kid to grow up in a state or a country where you just do the things that you're supposed to do and report and ask for help when you cross a line and get completely kicked off everything for it is I wish I hadn't I wish I hadn't asked for help thank you I'm so frazzled. Um, Eli, I'm so sorry that you had this story to share. I wish that everything was perfect. You were enjoying your last trimester of pregnancy. This is shameful. It's criminal. Um, turns my stomach. Um, Alex Lawson, you are up with Bill Coleman on deck. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, okay. Um, my name is Alex. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm 38 years old and I live in Burlington. Um, I'm an engineer and I'm a single mom. Um, and being a single mom and having grown up poor and been poor for most of my life, um, I'm really familiar with how broken uh, our entire system is. Um, I... Uh, I constantly, for most of my life, um, I'm, I'm doing okay now, but for most of my life, I lived under fear of homelessness. Um, I didn't have health insurance for most of my life. Um, every door was closed to my face every time I tried to get help of any kind from the state. Um, and, uh, and then when my father, or when I was around, I guess 27 years old, my father uh, got a, a diagnosis um, like a weird blood test back and he needed to get a diagnosis. Uh, I, so he came back from where he was retired and um, we took him to the hospital, but he didn't have health insurance because he, his entire life he was an independent contractor. And uh, with, you know, it, this was like right before Obamacare. So um, he didn't, you know, even have that. And there was no way to like get checkups or anything. And it turned out he had a stage four prostate cancer, which is a very treatable cancer if you have health insurance and can go see doctors. Um, but uh, they basically said there's, um, they did an x-ray. They said that the cancer's in your bones. You don't have health insurance. So there's nothing we can do. And they sent him home to die. Um, and uh, I had to fight with, with Medicaid for 
months to get him declared indigent and try to get him treatment. And, you know, he, he didn't make it ultimately, but, um, but I mean, it's just the, the system that we live in that is profit at all costs that sends people home to die is just so unjust and it's happening to people every single day. Um, it's just, it's, that's what's radical. And th this, you know, getting housing and healthcare is not radical. What's radical is selling out every single person in this country just for like modern land barons so that they can make more money um, and, and crush people's lives in the process. Um, so I, I'm no stranger to any of this. And um, I just, all of this stuff is a human right and nobody should ever have to go through the hoops and everything that I had to go through just to get like the slightest bit of help. Nobody should be impoverished for getting sick. Nobody should be wondering if they're gonna have a roof over their head. And this is unsustainable. We cannot keep letting politicians sell out our futures to corporations and wealthy people and let people suffer. And so that's why I'm here to fight for this. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Alex. Um, Bill Coleman, you're up next with Sean Campbell on deck, please. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, I, I'm going to be talking about uh, my experiences with rural poverty and addiction to alcohol and some other drugs. Um, they are really taking place earlier in my life, um, but I, I learned a, a lot about um, the problems with the system that are just so completely unfair. Um, and these are problems that continue to this day. There's, there's no change taking place under this um, system that favors extremely wealthy people who have um, more or less got the system rigged. Um, where they, they pay very minimal taxes and they can accumulate extraordinary quantities of wealth while um, nearly everyone is um, living from, if, if they're even fortunate enough to have a job, living from paycheck to paycheck. Um, um, I, I ended up moving out to um, the cheapest housing I could find when I was in the throes of my addiction, mostly to alcohol. Um, I moved to a town I'd never heard of, um, $50 a month for a shack that was out there in a part of town. No one had lived in this place for quite a few years. There was no running water. I had to um, find some trees to burn and um, just um, carry water. You know, that's kind of like third world type activity, but that's that's where my um, so-called third world is all one word world. But, um, you know, I was living that way right up in um, the northeastern part of the state and um it was a really harsh life and um, I, I was isolated. This is like kind of hidden um, poverty that's, that's more or less invisible most of the time, except when I would emerge from this woodland and um, go hitchhiking around. But it was, it was very difficult. There was no hope of finding employment or anything. People would tell me to get a job when I was hitchhiking. My clothes were all torn up. I was smelly. People could probably see I was under the influence nearly all the time. And um, I had no hope of even being able to um, get off of, um, of any of these drugs that I was using. Um, I just used whatever I could get my hands on. And originally I'd gotten into a lot of trouble um, as a young teenager with just um, what seemed like insufficient access to cannabis, which was... Um, so I, I was constantly... Um, trying to locate enough cannabis just to respond to some um, difficulties in my own life. I ended up using a drug that was really um, harmful that had like a half-life to get it out of my system of about 20 years. And my behavior became really unpredictable, scary for some people. And I really didn't even know what I was doing a lot of the time combined with really heavy use of alcohol. So I just wandered around um, even if I had a home, sometimes I could barely remember where it was or I was physically unable to make it there. I never had any transportation of my own, like I say, hitchhiking around. I wouldn't know where I'd end up. Um, and people just turned their backs. You know, we need a system of um, 
having health care available for all and an addiction needs to be recognized as a health issue, not something to be scorned and criminalized and all this, because it just drove my addiction right underground as it does for other people and drives people into deviant circles where um, all sorts of criminal behavior becomes a, a way of living, a way of continuing to carry forward. And it's not willful use of drugs at all. It's just like an ongoing situation where people just use on a day in and day out basis. It's not like, oh, I decided to become um, addicted. And so I thought I would just um, do this because I'm lazy and indigent and um, it's no fun working anyhow. I was totally unable to work. You know, I had no ability to support myself. So that's just misconceptions about we need health care for all we need sufficient housing for all, and we, people need ad, access to nutritious food every day of their lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, addiction certainly has a hold on this area in the Northeast Kingdom still. Um, Amanda Spector, you're up next with Mary Gagnon on deck. Thank you. Um, my name is Amanda and I live in Westford, Vermont. I'm a veterinarian and every day I see pet owners who cannot afford the recommended medical or surgical care for their pets. One of the most common reasons I hear for why pet owners can't afford treatment is that they have high medical expenses for themselves or for their family members. A pet owner the other week told me she just finished paying off $10,000 of medical debt after a traumatic brain injury. And one yesterday told me she was caring for a family member with type one diabetes. Both of these financial burdens impacted their ability to afford care for their pets and in turn caused emotional distress for these pet owners who don't wanna see their animals in discomfort. Unaffordable human healthcare has far reaching impacts that influence families, their human and non-human family members, emotional well-being, and also the viability of small businesses that depend on disposable income from consumers. I tell pet owners that it isn't fair that our medical system can't figure out how to take care of human health in an affordable way. And they always agree with me. The signs are clear that it's well past time for Medicaid for all. Healthcare is a human right. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. As an obsessed cat owner, um, I just, I tell them all the time when they're trying to do crazy things, don't jump off that mommy doesn't have emergency vet money. Um, Mary Gagnon and then Heather Pfaff, you're next. Hi, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, I wasn't intending to speak tonight, um, but I was moved by all the stories that I heard everybody telling and I wanted to reinforce um, everybody's efforts. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly tell our uh, portion of our story. Um, my husband and I have worked together over the years, multiple different jobs. Um, and a couple of years ago, he uh, had to retire earlier than anticipated uh, due to some complications following a cancer. Um, I'm his primary caregiver and driver and helper around the house. Um, so I'm I wasn't working during COVID and I'm not certain I'll be able to go back to work, um, at least not full time under the circumstances. We are just eking by on um, his social security. Um, I'm not due for my social security for a couple of years. Um, we are both relying on Medicaid, his to help supplement his Medicare and me completely for my care. Uh, and uh, our, our son and his wife have moved into our small rental house with us um, because they were anticipating buying a home that would be able to house all four of us. But then um, 
with COVID and the change in the real estate market, nothing was available within their price range. And they're both full-time teachers. So it affects more than people that are on the Medicaid, whether the Medicaid continues. And it shouldn't have to be a burden that's multiple generations to take care of one person. So we really need to rearrange the system. The golden parachutes of the CEOs at the insurance companies and the big budgets that are earned by the lobbyists are leaving too many of us to suffer and we need something different. And I thank everybody who took the time to talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for speaking um, impromptu. Um, it's uh, really special to see your decor in the background. Um, Heather Pfaff, we're ready for you. <laughs> Hi, um, I guess I'd like to just give you a little part of my journey. Uh, I am a home health care provider 24 seven for a disabled client. I make too much for Medicaid and not enough to pay for health, my health insurance. My deductible is through the roof and I'm still struggling to try and figure out why I have a huge deductible and a huge out of pocket. I have medications that I have to go off of for six months of the year because I can't afford those co-pays. So I have to pick and choose my medications out of 20 of them. I am getting to the point where I can't do this work anymore. I have a wrecked back and various other maladies. And um, I think we do need Medicare for all because this trying to struggle by, trying to get by on medications, they, they tell you uh, don't stop that uh, because it could cause other problems or seizures or something like that. And it's, it's very difficult to try and get by on, uh, on the medications that you don't, you don't have. I've had my insulin held hostage until I paid two months premium before they would release it. I had to borrow money from someone to get my insulin. And it was demoralizing. And there's just, there's no words for, for it. It should not be happening. And uh, that's why I'm here. That's why I chose to speak up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, Griffin, and then Grace. Hi, all. My name is Griffin Shumway. I'm a teacher. I'm a member of the Vermont Worker Center, and I live in White River Junction. In two weeks, it'll be the eighth anniversary of my stepdad's death. I was 24. I was on his insurance plan. And when he died on March 20, 29th, I lost his my health care as as soon as I lost my stepdad, or two days later as as I lost my stepdad. While grieving with my family, arranging a funeral, and reflecting on the future for all of us. I had to go out and I had to get health insurance. The burden of finding health care in the richest nation in all of history is a burden no one, let alone a grieving person, should need to face. Despite this, I had to scramble in a fit of grief to solve issues that the state had promised it would solve by 2017. As a teacher, I see daily students who are struggling without a home. Students and their families who are moving regularly because they can't afford rent, or who doubled and tripled up. Students who should be able to focus, learn, and be our next generation of leaders, but instead they're underslept uh, and overstressed because the system under which we live does not guarantee them housing, does not guarantee them food, and does not guarantee them health care. Pandemic support has been a godsend for many of us, but it's not enough. 
And ending those supports rather than extending them will only mean worse outcomes for students and worse outcomes for communities. I'm here speaking tonight uh, to emphasize the need to expand our system, not to end it. We need to take a step forward. We can't afford to take a step back. Forward together, not one step back. Thank you. Thank you, Griffin, wrapping the, oh. Rats. Thank you, Griffin, repping the Upper Valley. Grace, you're next. Hi, everyone. My name is Grace Vincent, and I've lived in Vermont for almost 30 years now. And I had a job that I had for nearly 20 years, and I was like dedicated to my work. And I thought I was in the middle class. But then one day I came home from work and I was not myself. I was sitting at the table, my face down in my cup of tea. My daughter came home and found me luckily. And I had had a massive stroke, which afterwards resulted in my being in rehab for about six or eight weeks, getting sent up to Dartmouth and just barely surviving. And I can't even tell you what happens after you've had like a major healthcare emergency like that if you haven't been there that you feel like your life is not your own anymore or that that was someone else it's not you anymore and of course on top of that I lost my job because I couldn't go back to work when they wanted me to I lost the house that my family had helped me buy and had been working for 60 to 80 hours a week for most of the time I worked that that company and I thought oh well I've done everything I'm supposed to do so now this has happened to me and I'll be all right but no get out of the hospital and try to figure out what I'm supposed to do now so I reached out to a community of people who had brain injuries and through those people I ended up connecting with the worker cent Vermont Worker Center. And I'll never regret that day for the rest of my life because over those years I have been working and developing friendships with other people in Vermont. I saw three of my best friends die because they didn't have health insurance. One was an independent contractor who worked his whole life and developed cancer in his late 30s. And at 42, he died of cancer and couldn't even get any pain medication because he didn't have insurance. And he only survived through much of it because he was able to get marijuana to help him with the pain, but the doctors wouldn't give him any pain medication. And my other friend had a massive brain tumor that for years she was in and out of the hospital where they did nothing for her, ended up dying at age 52 because she had no, no health insurance and really no care. So those are some of the reasons my own health and the friends of mine that I've seen die because of the lack of care. And if we put up with this nonsense another minute longer, we're crazy. And that's how they look at us. We must be stupid or crazy because we're not, we're not doing anything about it. We're just putting up with it. We're paying bills we can't pay. They're raising prices that no one could pay and enough is enough of this stuff. This is why we fight every day. And I vowed un to fight until my last breath to stop this violence against all my brothers and sisters here in Vermont and across the country. We can't, we can't do this anymore. These people have just broken my heart tonight. And my story, I always think, oh, you know, that's kind of sad or whatever, because it had a happy ending now that I'm with the Worker Center. But... There's no happy ending for most people. The happy ending is if you die, and it's my feeling that they just assume we die because we're too expensive for them to take care of. They'd rather spend it giving the money to corporations and people who have done nothing to deserve getting any money. But those of us who are out there sick or disabled, we get nothing. And we just assume might as well go away because if we're dead, we can't complain about it. But we're not dead yet, so we're going to start talking. Keep walking, keep on talking, and keep fighting them. Can't pay, won't pay medical bills. 
too bad if they don't get their money. If they don't get their money, then they can't keep doing what they're doing. So I think we should all be against paying any of these bills to these greedy profiteers in the healthcare industry. Enough already. They've got plenty. We don't need to give them our little pocket change that we need to eat and try to find a place to live. Healthcare is a human right. Housing is health care. House, housing is a human right, and we deserve to have it all, and we're going to demand it, and that's the end of that. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Oh, thank you, Grace. Uh, just one last call for anybody that wants to tell their story. Last call. Okay. We're not seeing anyone, but this isn't the, isn't the last time for you to tell your story. Um, we'd, we'd like to invite people to do the stories project. If you didn't get a chance to speak tonight, or even if you did, um, some of these stories need to be told. So please reach out to the Worker Center on our website, on our Facebook page, or anybody that you know at the Worker Center and say that you would like to um, tell your story, record your story. Um, I am going to um, just uh, put, put, put mute myself for a second. Brian, uh, we appreciate you coming tonight, but we would really like to just have um, the legislators be part of the listening panel. Um, if you do have your own healthcare story, we'd love to hear it as part of the stories project. Um, we're aware that um, you know every everybody might have a story, and I see Michael, you have your hand up. Um, I just really wanted to say thank you. It's re I appreciate listening to the stories. Thank you, everyone who shared. Um, it's not really taking up space, Brian. I need I need some help here. I'll, how center. about I take a minute and just share <clears throat> my healthcare struggle a little bit? It's uh, it, it's not to the degree of others. I'm going to just do this. I've been like I was I've been I didn't think I'd be able to stay this long, but it worked out. So I'm glad I did. Um, so I'm a healthcare provider as well as a legislator. And what's messed up is that I have to pay full price for my health insurance, even though I work for these companies who haven't raised the pay for us for, for many, many years. And unlike other healthcare providers, when my, when my clients can't pay their co-payment, I just see them anyway. And I, I don't take them to collections because like the person just said, I'm not going to fight with someone over, over $10. You know what I mean? Like I, I, that's not why I'm doing it. But it, it hurts me. It hurts my spirit that I, I'm doing this work and that it, that my clients are not taken care of properly by this healthcare system financing. And that as a provider, I'm not, not like my labor is extracted, you know, and um, <clears throat> I got COVID really bad last November and I've been struggling with long COVID since. And I'm afraid to go to the doctor because I like my deductible so high. And so even a person who's like working four jobs and is like a professional, like in, in the mental health system is like struggling to pay, to like access healthcare. And like, how messed up is it? Like when I was a kid and I worked at a hot dog stand, like they fed me every day. They fed me every day. Like, you know, part of the job was eating. We were serving food I got to eat. I'm providing healthcare, but like, I don't get, I don't have it either. And that's just, it's just like, it's the irony of how messed up the system is. So that's, that's, my brief healthcare story is like just that it's unjust for all of us, the providers, the patients. Um, and I, I look forward to organizing with you all um, more. I look forward to your action this week and I really appreciate people having the courage to speak out. And it, it, you know, it was really emotional to hear your stories. So thank you and I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, it's always awkward like, to, but um, it was really important to hear your perspective as a person and a health care provider in the mental health field. So, Avery, on this note, I'm going to ask you to wrap this section up before we get to our call to action and closing. 
with a song. I think we need to hear your voice. All right, everyone. Uh, really powerful evening tonight to hear all your stories um, and uh, just such collective commitment to change this unjust system um, that we're not going to let turn us around. Uh, these are a couple songs from the movement, Poor People's Campaign, and many other movements, civil rights and labor as well. Sing along if you would like, on mute, of course. Ain't gonna let nobody turn us round, turn us round, turn us round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn us round. We're gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking. Marching for our human rights. Ain't gonna let no cutoffs turn us round, turn us round, turn us round. Ain't gonna let no cutoffs turn us round. We're gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking. Marching for our human rights. Ain't gonna let for profit health care turn us round, turn us round, turn us round. Ain't gonna let for profit health care turn us round. We're gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking. Marching for our human rights. Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land where I'm back? Don't you want to go to that land? I'm gonna go to that land. Don't you want to go to that land where I'm back? We'll all have health care in that land. We'll all have health care in that land. All have health care in that land where I'm back. We'll all have health care in that land. I'm gonna go to that land. We'll all have health care in that land where I'm back. We'll all be housed in that land. We'll all be housed in that land. I'll be housed in that land where I'm back. We'll all be housed in that land. I'm gonna go to that land. I'll be housed in that land where I'm back. We'll all be free in that land. We'll all be free in that land. We'll all be free in that land where I'm bound. We'll all be free in that land. I'm gonna go to that land. We'll all be free in that land where I'm bound. We'll all be free in that land. I'm gonna go to that land. We'll all be free in that land where I'm bound. Where I'm bound. Well, thank you, Brother Avery. Always bring it at home. Um, whew, today we've heard powerful testimony. These stories are going to stay for me. And every time I raise a fist or take a step, I'm going to do it for all of you and for Eli's baby. Um, this is just a small fraction of those who are impacted by these crises. We have to find ways of connecting with the thousands of people in Vermont who are just waiting for the opportunity to share their story and organize with change. Who's with me? Show me sign language applause or a thumbs up if you're ready to move together, not one step back. One step back. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Eliza. Awesome. Thank you all so much. So um, we also want to thank the public officials who joined us this evening. 
We'll be sharing the recording of this forum with officials who weren't able to attend the full event and others who had conflicts and have requested it. It will also be posted on YouTube. We hope that you'll take up and champion these issues with your colleagues and use your position to ensure that our state's policies and practices reflect our shared values and not the interests of working class people in our state. Ashley. Finally, we also know that this is about more than just Vermont. There are 140 million poor people and people who are one emergency away from economic ruin in this country. And we are on the move. Through the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival and the nonviolent Medicaid army, we are fighting for our basic needs at the same time that we're developing the leaders we need to end poverty once and for all, to end systemic racism, ecological devastation, militarism, and the war economy, and to ensure that everybody has the right to live. Julie? This movement isn't gonna build itself. So we're all organizers in this room today. In that light, we wanna leave you with three charges. Number one, Make a call to your legislators tomorrow to protect and expand these pandemic measures. Check your email tomorrow morning for the call in day details. Ashley. Number two, get the word out about the Medicaid cutoffs. Take the 10 petition challenge, getting 10 people to sign the Forward Together petition by April 1st. Again, you'll find that in the chat and on our Facebook page and website. You can also write a letter to the editor, record your story on video for our social media campaign, and put flyers up at your local clinics or anywhere that community members gather. Also, you can join us for a new member orientation this coming Monday, March 21st, from 6 to 7.30 on Zoom. And there's going to be more info and the link to register there um, on our website. Um, so if you really liked what you saw tonight and you haven't organized with us before, please sign up for orientation. Eliza. Whoop, whoop. Yes. All right. Lastly, um, get on the bus from Vermont, June 18th for the Mass Poor Peoples and Low Wage Workers Assembly and Moral March on DC. Organized by the Poor Peoples Campaign and National Call for Moral Revival. Sorry, I got a little excited. Sign up at poorpeoplescampaign.org and look for transportation details from Vermont coming soon. Thanks again, everyone who came this evening. Forward together. Forward together. Together. Step back. Thank you all. Thank right you. on. Thanks, everyone. You can all come off mute and say bye now if you want to. One step back. Not one step back. Not one step back. Bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. You're welcome. Bye. 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 Nice job, Grace. Way to go. Way to go.